open up your Bibles, if you would. Let's start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians, it's right in front of 2 Thessalonians. You notice how my mind is like a steel trap. You notice I notice that. 1 Thessalonians comes before 2 Thessalonians. Right? Yeah. This is our... <laughs> This is our ongoing series that we call Person to Person. So all of the messages in this series are all based on questions that have come from you, the studio audience. We asked you guys to submit questions to me and that I would go through these questions and prepare sermons based on your questions. Now, when we get done with this series, and we've got a few more to go, but when we get done with this series, we're going to begin a new book study in the book of Acts. So I can't wait for that, very stoked about that as well. But the topic this morning, which came from a question from you, is what is holiness? Holiness, the topic of holiness. And, uh, you know, I, I've taught on it in various ways before. And uh, I always feel like holiness is a difficult topic for us to kind of wrap our heads around. And maybe it's because... In the world that we live in today, nothing is holy. Nothing. And, and I would even say that we've made certain that nothing is holy or sacred. And the things that perhaps we considered holy or sacred at one point, we've unmade them and we've repackaged them so they're no longer holy. They're just easier to understand, grasp, or just to ignore altogether. The word holy can be defined, at least it is by Webster's Dictionary, as something exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. Also, it can be that which is the opposite of common or profane. Now, what makes this word, the word holy, scary for us is that in the Bible, if you're a Christian this morning, if you've been born again by God's Spirit, if you've never been born again by God's Spirit, I pray that you would be by, by the end of the service today. It's why you're here, um, whether you knew it or not. But the fact is, is that everybody that has been born again by God's Spirit is called to be holy. In, in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 48, Jesus says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Have you ever read that passage and then despaired? Like, how is that even remotely possible? What does that even mean? I like the, uh, the Amplified, I just read that out of the New King James, the Amplified version of the Bible. It reads like this. You, therefore, must be perfect, that is, growing into complete maturity of godliness in mind and character having reached the proper height of virtue and integrity, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the word perfect as it's defined in Scripture means complete, lacking nothing, fully mature. Okay, so what does that mean for you and for me to grow up, to mature, to become complete, and even to be holy? What does that mean? Now, Jesus, we ask you, if you would please instruct us through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, these are big and important topics, sometimes hard to understand. So we pray that you'd just clear out the fog and help us to see the truth of your word here. So minister to us, Lord, about what this means, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's break it down like this. I'm going to point number one. Um, which is always a good place to start uh, at the beginning. Point number one from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 to 5, and that is, God makes you holy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting in verse 3, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Sanctification, that's a great word. It's a Bible word. It's a word that doesn't really get used out in the real 
world so much. I'd like a burger, and if you could sanctify me in order of fries, that would be great. It's just not a word that commonly gets used, but it means essentially set apart to God. That's what sanctification means, set apart to God. In other words, when I am sanctified, because it says right here, this is the will of God, your sanctification, you. Anybody that's been born again by God's Spirit. Now what that means then is, I belong to Him now. I've been set apart from the world to Him. I belong to Him now, and I wish to do what He wants. Now there's kind of a good barometer right there, isn't it? It's like, do you really want to do what He wants you to do? I mean, it seems straight ahead. And then, of course, here in verses 3 to 5, the example that, that the Apostle Paul uses in this particular portion of the letter is sexual immorality. Now, here's the tricky part about holiness. And that is, um, there are things that I must do if I am to demonstrate what God has done in my life. In other words, if you've been born again by God's Spirit, if you've been set apart to God, then your life should reflect that, and the things that we do and even don't do should reflect the fact that God has done this in my life. Now, in this particular case, it's uh, abstaining from sexual immorality. And, and that's sexual immorality is a big word. Sometimes it's um, a translated fornication. And all that simply means is any kind of sexual activity outside of the, the male-female marital relationship. So it's kind of a catch-all word. It kind of means anything that's sexual activity outside of men and women who is married. And that can include all kinds of premarital sex and adultery, homosexuality. It can include all different kinds of things. And then in verses 4 to 5, we got this idea that the goal is to learn how to control your desires that they may be expressed in alignment with God's purpose. Uh, God's given us these desires. Okay, well, let's express them in, in alignment with God's purpose. Now, that word alignment, that's important. I use that word here a lot. Alignment. Think about that word because it plays a huge role in what we're talking about here today. So, file that away. We'll come back to that. So, sexual purity. Sexual purity. It's This is important. It's not what we do to become holy. It's what we do because we are holy. Okay? That should be, that's up on the jumbotrons. It's on your handout too. In this particular case, not the only case, but in this particular case, sexual purity, keeping ourselves aligned with God's purpose for sexual expression, it's what we do because God has made us holy, not because we want to become holy. Do you understand that so far? <clears throat> Let me clarify, Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. Exodus chapter 3, verse 5. You are familiar with this passage, probably. This is Moses, who is tending sheep, and as he's out there in the wilderness, he sees a shrubbery that is on fire. Well, it says a bush. It could have been a shrubbery, but it's a bush. Or so it's described here. And he sees this bush and it's burning. And as it's burning, it's not being consumed by the flames, so he approaches it to see what the story is about. And as he approaches, there in verse 4, hears a voice calling to him out of the burning bush. And the voice says, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And then this voice said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place where you stand is holy ground. <clears throat> now that's significant. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Now, what made the ground holy? I mean, out of the entire wilderness, Moses steps up to this one particular bush, in this one particular piece of real estate. And if you've seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, it's up on the side of a hill. I don't know if that's what happened or not. So there's Moses talking to a bush that's on fire. What made that spot holy? The presence of God. What? The presence of God. Oh. 
the presence of God made that spot holy because it wasn't any holier than any other piece of real estate out there in the vast wilderness where he was tending his sheep. The place you're standing is holy ground. Why? Because God was there. And he alone is holy, 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 as Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3 describes him. Now, if you've been born again by God's Holy Spirit, the Bible says that his Holy Spirit now dwells within you. You can see that in Matthew chapter 14, verses 19 and 20. You can see that in John chapter 14, verse 17, or here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, where it says, flee sexual immorality, there's that again. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So now, if God takes up residence within us when we are born again by his Holy Spirit, what does that make us? If God can make a bush and a piece of dirt holy by virtue of his very presence, what does that mean for us? It means his presence in you makes you holy. Now, we realize, at least intellectually, that the holiness we possess is because he lives in us. Not because of anything that I've done. It's simply because he's in me and he makes me holy. Now then, our task remains to grow in that, to mature in that, for it is his will for us and our responsibility to follow through on that. Okay, you with me so far? Okay, good. Point number two then. God calls you to be holy. You notice I, that's, I capitalized that and I made it bold and I even made it in italics in my notes. Be holy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, for God didn't call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Notice that right there? Now that means that we are to dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity. Dedicate ourselves to the most thorough purity. You see, when God saves us, he saves us by something, for something, and to something. That is, he saves us by his grace. That's unmerited favor. He saves us by his grace for his purpose, and that is to be holy. Got that? He saves us by his grace for his purpose, and that is to be holy. Now, in the last point, I mentioned the word alignment. Alignment. I want you to think again about that word, alignment. You, you rem they don't, do they do front-end alignments on cars anymore? With unibody and all of that stuff, I thought maybe that went by the wayside. You know what it, what it means when your front end goes out of alignment? Your car kind of pulls to the right or pulls to the left. It doesn't go straight down, straight down the lane. Al alignment, alignment, alignment. We're not talking, I'm not talking anyways, about simply behaving better. Although holiness certainly is that. We're talking about becoming greater and more perfectly aligned with God. Becoming greater and more perfectly aligned with God. Now, many might wonder, what is my calling? Okay, I'm a Christian. Is they, have you ever wondered, what is my calling? You don't have to raise your hand. Some are called to be pastors. Some are called to be missionaries. Some others in some highly visible leadership position. And that may or may not be you. But every Christian is called to be holy. Every Christian. Again, Matthew chapter 5 in verse 48. You know, I just grabbed a portion of my Bible, flipped it over, and it opened straight to Matthew chapter 5. See, pastors can do that. We just know. 
We don't have to look. We just know right where it is. I'm just kidding. Where Jesus says this, therefore you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, here's, here's how we might want to see this then. Holiness is what God requires of you. Holiness is what he does inside of you. And holy is what he wants you to be. With me so far? We um, often break down, I think, right here, partly because we, we don't get a whole lot of teaching about holiness. We don't hear a lot of teaching about holiness. And then when we see a passage like Matthew 5, 48, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7, you didn't call us to uncleanness, but to holiness, you think, okay, okay, that's all well and good, but holiness clearly is for somebody else. It definitely is not me, because how many of you really feel holy? Nobody, I think, Maddie just raised her hand down here. You no? Know? <laughs> no? We don't, we don't feel holy. Holy. As a matter of fact, sometimes we kind of subconsciously try to avoid the word altogether. Because I know what the Bible says about it, and I, you know, I just honestly, it just seems like it's just inconceivable. Inconceivable. Do you not think that word means what you think it means? Hello? Princess Bride? Anybody? Anybody? Okay. You with me? Okay. Okay. Shrubby. Yeah. That's Monty Python. Did you, did you get that one? Okay, good. Good. That's the thing with, with cultural references. It's like I come from a particular generation, and what I can remember of my generation, you know, it's not everybody relates. So, but I'm trying. I'm trying to relate to you people. Here's the problem with holiness, I think. Or maybe it's just me. Holy living means... I don't get to do everything I want to do. There's the problem. Really, let's be honest. Holy living means I don't get to do everything I want to do. Because certainly my body and my mind may wish to do all kinds of things. There's parts of me that wants to do things that are not good, not right, not in alignment with God. But holy living means I seek to do what God wants me to do. I want to reference Romans chapter 6 in verse 19, where God's word says this. The Apostle Paul writing to the church in Rome, he says, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. That's me, weakness of the flesh. For just as you presented your members, that's your body, as slaves of uncleanness, and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now, present your members, your body, as slaves of righteousness for holiness. Remember what you used to do with your body, with your life, with your passions, with your desires, with your intents, with your thoughts? Remember what you used to do with them? Don't do that anymore. We're in turn going to turn them over to the Lord and say, Lord, I, I want to be in greater alignment with you and your purpose for my life. And your purpose for my life is holiness. You're making, you, you, you've made me holy by your presence here. You're making me increasingly more holy, at least reflecting that greater in my behavior, in my activity, the things I do, the things I don't do, the things I say, the things I don't say. And so I was thinking about it like this. Every step of obedience is a step into greater alignment with God. Conversely, every step of disobedience is a step out of alignment with God. You ever feel like your life has just got a kink in it? It's just, you're not pulling straight down the road. It's like you keep pulling to the right or to the left. It's either I want to veer off into all the things that I want to do, or I want to veer off into legalism and beat myself over the head every time I do something or I just can't seem to pull straight down the road well maybe it's because think about this every Christian is called to be holy 
Every step of obedience is a step into greater alignment. Every step of disobedience is a step out of alignment. It's not out of salvation. Don't lose your salvation every time you stumble or fall. If that was true, we'd be in horrible, desperate trouble. Rather, again, every Christian is called to be holy, so what do we do about that? Point number three is this. Being holy is something to pursue. It's something to pursue. I'm going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, where God's word says this. Pursue peace with all people. Now, there's a there's an opening to a passage, right? Pursue peace with all people. I could spend an hour just on that. <laughs> pursue peace with all people. Hey, any, any, any of you young people out there, pursue peace with your parents. Parents, pursue peace with your kids. Husbands and wives, pursue peace with one another. Boyfriends, girlfriends, pursue peace with one another. Greater alignment with God. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one can see the Lord. Oh. Holiness, without which no one can see the Lord. Now, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8 says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, here's the way I was thinking about it. And I wrote it down like this. See what you think. What God requires in you, he will do. You see that? What God requires in you, he will do. Our responsibility is to align ourselves with that process. Because there is certainly the, the fact that God makes us holy because he dwells in our hearts by faith when we're born again. But then you guys all know full well that just because you're born again doesn't mean everything's rainbows and puppy dogs for the rest of your natural life. As much as we wish that it was. It's not. It's a struggle. Sometimes it's really difficult. As we like to, we like to say here sometimes, the Christian life is simple. It's just not easy. It's simple. God says, you know, this is, this is what I've done for you. This is what I want for you. This is what I want from you. It's simple, but that doesn't make it easy. Now, in, in both of the verses that I just read, Hebrews 12, 14, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, in both of those verses, it is implied that we must be holy to go to heaven. Okay? But I cannot make myself holy by my behavior. No one can. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Let's try an experiment. Okay, on the count of three, I want you to make yourself holy. Okay? One, two, three. Go. 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 Oh, nope. Too late. I already blew it. It didn't work. Right? You can't make yourself holy, but I have to be holy to go to heaven. So that which is required, God does in me and for me by taking up residence in my heart when I've been born again by his spirit. So it's one thing to believe intellectually. It's a whole other thing to be born again and have the creator of the universe, his son crucified and rose again on the third day and his Holy Spirit dwelling in my heart by faith. That is what it means to be born again. But I can't make myself holy. So God makes us holy by indwelling us. Then we react to that by desiring what he desires for us. I was talking with, uh, maybe it was uh, the Wednesday night. Maybe it was Mud and Miracles Wednesday night, I think. It was weird. It was weird. I got saved on a Sunday night. It, what was weird is, you know, Saturday night, Sunday morning, there was this, my life was fine. I had no issues with my life at all. Doing the things that I was doing, thinking the things that I thought, believing the things that I believed, doing the things that I was doing. Then I got saved on Sunday night and on Monday morning, everything was different. I was looking at things that were perfectly fine on Saturday night. As a matter of fact, on Saturday night, we thought we had a lot of fun. And then on Monday morning, I'm looking at those things going, oh, oh, Maybe, maybe I ought not to do that. Because all of a sudden, God's dwelling in my heart by faith. Now my eyes are open to see those very same things in a different way. Now I'm looking at him going, okay, okay, I think I, think I better not do that anymore. So how do we pursue holiness? And let me tell you this, friends. If you have no interest or desire whatsoever to do what God 
wants you to do, then I would rightfully, I think, question whether you've been saved or not, whether you've been born again or not. Because I think part of the, the natural reaction to what God has done for us, the natural response to the creator of the universe taking up residence in our heart is, I want to do what he wants me to do. If for no other reason, for the sake of what he has done for me. So how do we do this? How do we do this? I, I see kind of a game plan in Ephesians chapter 4. Turn over there or scroll in your device to Ephesians chapter 4. You there? You there? I'll wait for you. The church I got saved in was huge. As a matter of fact, when I got saved there, it was huge. It was even huger after I left, which I don't think has anything to do with me leaving. <laughs> but we didn't have devices back then. We just had Bibles. And when the pastor said, turn in your Bible, 3,000 people would turn in their Bibles. And you could hear the Bible pages rustle all through the congregation. And I kind of missed that sound. I told you, I want to I make an app. So when you scroll in your app, it makes Bible page turning sounds. Is that, is that a cool idea? Isn't it? Don't steal that idea. That's mine. Okay, so we've all turned over to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 20 of Ephesians chapter 4. But you, you have not so learned Christ. You're certainly not learning him this other way, here, you're learning this, here this morning. You've not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that, here's what you do, here's the truth that's in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Note that the pursuit of holiness, our growth in holiness, is something that we get to participate in. You see that? We get to participate in it. Notice the words put off and put on. Put off, that's the old behavior. I'm not going to behave in the same way that I used to. I'm not going to do the things that I used to do, and I'm going to work really hard on trying not to think the way that I used to think. Because God's given me eyes to see things differently than I've ever seen them before. What was perfectly fine on Saturday night, all of a sudden on Monday morning, I'm looking at it going, ooh, that doesn't look real good. So our growth in holiness is something we get to participate in every single day. We get to choose to put off the old nature, to put on the new nature. We're talking about this Wednesday night at Mud and Miracles about suiting up, suiting up for this every single day, putting on the new nature. I'm not going to act the way that I used to act. Even today, even today, there's things in each one of our lives, things that we did yesterday that we should not do. Maybe things that we did or thought even this morning that we should not do or think again. And you know what they are because the Holy Spirit of God convicts your heart about that. The way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we react. Which in my mind, your reaction tells you a lot more about what's going on in your heart than your actions. Right? Because anybody can act good for a while but our reactions oh that's a whole different story altogether every day we get to choose purity and holiness which is obedience again back in first Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 3 to 5 we talked very briefly about sexual purity so then when you face the temptation to whatever sexual sin it might be you get to choose what you're going to do. You get to choose whether you will go ahead and do what you desire, which may be disobedience, taking you out of alignment with God, or 
you get to control or master that desire or passion and obey the Lord, which is purity, obedience, and holiness, which is alignment. Is that making some sense? You okay? You with me still? So look at it like this. Every choice we make puts holiness on the line. Right? Every choice we make puts holiness on the line. Now I'm not talking about the choice of, you know, you're at Shake Shack and you get the bacon and cheese fries or just plain fries or just fries with the cheese. I mean, there's three choices there. That, that's not what I'm talking about. There's, there's no disobedience when it comes to french fries at all. It's always obedience, if you ask me. <laughs> I think that's true. Potatoes, I think, are a gift from the Lord. And we should enjoy them in all of their manifestations. And cheese always makes them better, I think. I'm talking about behaviorally, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, our passions, our desires. Because one of the things that God gives us, and we referenced it over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is God gives us the ability to master our desires and not be mastered by them. Do I have the desire for certain things? Yes. Am I going to let that desire rule my life? Am I going to let my desire run my life? No. No. Not any of my passions or desires. I don't want any of them to run my life other than the passion or the desire to be the man that God wants me to be. To walk in alignment with Him. To stay in alignment with Him. Here's the point. It's your choice. God makes you holy, but what are you doing with what God has given you? What are you doing with it? Point number four, my last point. And that is holiness will be evident. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in verse 1. God's word says, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves, there's our participation again, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, oh look perfecting holiness in the fear of God holiness will be evident in other words a holy life will show now we mentioned the word sanctification earlier it, it simply means set apart but further scripturally biblically it means set apart from one thing to another. You understand that? Set apart from one thing to another. Now we are set apart from the world and the way that the world does things. I still live in the world, I still exist in the world, but I'm set apart from it spiritually. The world does things a particular way, the world sees things a particular way, and I don't. I see things differently. God has opened my eyes. I've been born again by his Holy Spirit. I look in his word. I see what he says is right and wrong. And I look at the way the world does things. And I see the difference between the two. And I think, I'd rather do it God's way, I think. I did it that way, the world's way before. Didn't work out all that great. Thought I was having a good time. Look at it in retrospect. Now it's all a little embarrassing. At least the parts that I can remember of it. But further... When we do that, when we act out of what he has made us to be, everyone's going to notice that. I mean, I'm not talking about walking down the street and you're glowing like you're radioactive or something. That's not what I'm talking about. But they're, they're going to see in the things that you do and the things that you don't do, the things that you say, the things you don't say, how you act, how you react to things. At some point or the other, the world's going to notice it. I had to have a medical procedure done one time, and I will not explain it to you. But <clears throat> when it was all over, the technician who was performing this um, dark ages form of torture upon my person, he says to me, so, he says, uh, what do you do? Like I was really in the mood to talk, you know, at that particular moment. And... And I said, well, I said, I'm, I'm the pastor of a church. He goes, ah, that explains it. I said, what? 
He said, usually when I do this to people, they're just cussing and swearing up a blue streak. He said, you didn't cuss at all. I said, well, yeah. I was thinking it. Just didn't say it outwardly. <laughs> Let me ask you this, friends. What does the world see in you? What does the world see in you? Like, like I say, we can put on a good show. Not at home with our families, with our spouses, with our kids, with our parents. We, we don't, that's really where everything goes off the rails, really, at home. What does your own family see in you? What does your husband or wife see in you? Kids, what do you see in your parents? What, is, what does people see in you? Do, do, does it see someone who just goes to church and calls himself a Christian? Or does the world around you see Jesus in you? Because he's there. If you've been born again, Jesus is there. Do you, does, does the world around you, do they see Jesus in you? Not just you, the person that calls himself a Christian. Not just the persona that you want them to see, the image the mask that you wear out in public. But do they see Jesus in you? Because that is holiness. And it will show. And without question, I would say, and this is just an opinion, and I know you didn't come here just for my opinion. You probably get too much of it as it is. But this is one of the greatest needs in the world today. For people to see Jesus in those of us that call ourselves Christians. For people to see Jesus, not churchianity, but Jesus, not who we vote for, we, not our political causes, oftentimes that just buries Jesus under an avalanche of stuff. What will make Jesus evident to all is when we are distinctively different from everyone else in the world. When everyone acts and believes that things like sex outside of marriage is completely normal and natural, we don't do it. I don't agree. I think this is the way that that desire that God gave us should be expressed. When I express it in alignment with the Lord and His plan, oh man, it's blessed. And to be perfectly honest with you, on a PG-13 message, you know, I... I done stuff when I wasn't a Christian and then when I was and it's a heck of a lot better when you're a Christian I'm just saying what do you want to do do it in alignment with God or not because you don't have to go ahead do whatever you want to do there's no law that says you can't do it sexual purity is an easy topic to pick on and talk about because we live in such a hyper sexualized kind of world but God's way is very different than the way of the world. The Apostle Peter gives us this encouragement in 2 Peter chapter 3. I like this one because sometimes it feels like the end of the world. Or sometimes it feels like we'd like the world to end. Any time now would be good. And so the Apostle Peter, writing about the day of the Lord when God brings things to a conclusion, it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, he says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? If we believe that the world is coming to an end, how should we behave? Holy and godly. That's how we should behave. Now, I'm, uh, uh, you know, when you get as old as me, you start thinking about things like time and how at the age that I'm at now, the chronological giftedness that I've achieved, I'm thinking, okay, I'm definitely on the shorter end of the string now. Right? There is, unless I live to be 126 years old, which I probably won't, I'm, I'm, I'm on the second half of things. And you start thinking, wow, that first, that first portion of my life went awfully, awfully fast. 
Ask Dick down here who's, what, 98? 98 years old now. How fast those 98 years went. Zoom. Gone. And here we are. So, what kind of people ought we to be? Hey, you could step outside the front door and get hit by a meteorite and die. Right outside the front door here. Could happen. You could get the coronavirus. You could get all kinds of stuff and you could die today. So what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be holy and godly people. Let me close with this. Pursuing holiness because um, being holy because he makes us holy. Let me start over. Pursuing holiness because holy I just cannot get this right. Okay, hold on. Pursuing holiness. Being holy because he makes us holy is a radical departure from the world around us. Holiness is not something to be afraid of. It is something to embrace, pursue, and live to the fullest. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all of your conduct. Amen. Today, appropriately enough, is Communion Sunday. And we've spent a lot of time talking about what God makes us. And God makes us holy by virtue of the fact that we are born again when we place our faith and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins. How does that happen? We violated God's laws. We've sinned against the Lord. It's his laws that we break. And when we do that, there's a penalty to pay for that every time. God is just, and you want justice, right? You want God to be just. So every time we violate a law, there's, there's a price to, to pay for that violation of the law. But Jesus, his son, came to die in our place for those violations of God's laws. So now when we place our faith and trust in Jesus for who he is and what he's done for us, God forgives us for those things. And in communion, when we do communion, this is what we commemorate. The fact that Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago for my violations of God's laws. And now I can be born again. I can have forgiveness from the Lord and have the Lord take up residence within my heart. Now here in this church, most of you know, but I'll tell you again, in this church, communion is for anybody that's been born again. Now, you can say, well, you know, I was confirmed, you know, when I was a kid, or, you know, I always take communion at my church. That's not what I'm saying. I'm asking you now, have you been born again by God's Spirit? If you have, participate in communion with us. If you have not been born again by God's Spirit, then do not participate in communion. When the elements of communion are handed out, just pass them by. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. We're not judging you or anything else. We're just asking you to respect how we do it. But rather, if you've never been born again by God's Spirit, why don't you take the opportunity right now to surrender your life to Christ, to enjoy the forgiveness that He can now supply you with, and participate in communion for the first time, understanding what these elements mean. So let's pause and let's pray. So Jesus, we, we look at these things and, and it seems almost beyond us. But Lord, we're encouraged at the same time because you said that you make us holy when you take up residence within us. We're blown away by that fact. But even as we think about it, Lord, perhaps there is someone here or even perhaps someone listening online that has never been born again by your spirit. And so I want to give you that opportunity right now as we pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. People are praying. Let me encourage you that being born again by God's Spirit has got nothing to do with church. This church or any other church has got nothing to do with me. This is strictly between you and God who made you. Just between you and Him. And all it is is you surrendering your life to Him placing your faith and trust in Him for what He has done for you to provide forgiveness for your sins and the opportunity now to be born again by His Spirit.
So even as we pray right now, you might pray, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you might pray just between you and him something like this. Lord Jesus, I know I need you. I know I, I need to be saved. I can feel it. I need your forgiveness for my sins. And so, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose from the dead, even though I don't understand it all. I believe you did it for me. Now, please, Jesus, rescue me. Come into my heart and save me. Cause me to be born again. Open my eyes. Fill me with your spirit. Make me yours. Make me holy. Even as you pray this, be assured. Jesus said, all who come to me, I would in no way cast out. He doesn't reject anyone that comes to him seeking for forgiveness. Trust him for this. And even as we're praying, some of us, I know I have, am acutely aware of those areas in my life where I'm just not acting out of holiness. I'm not being holy. Lord, whether it's my relationship to the world, to my spouse, to my family, to my work, even just internally, Lord, between you and me, I have not behaved in a holy manner. And Lord, we need your forgiveness. And that you would once again light within us that fire that desires alignment with you more than anything else. Burn that in us, Lord, we pray. As we sing this next song, the elements of communion will be handed out. Please hold on to them until we are all served. Thanks for watching this week's service. If you'd like to know more about this or other topics, please visit our website at cchnb.org. If you'd like to see us in person sometime, we have Sunday service at 10 a.m., a Tuesday night Bible study at 7 p.m., a Wednesday night Bible study for young adults at 6.30 p.m., and a Thursday night service at 7 p.m.